Uh, uh, all right. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. My name is Paul, one of the servants here at New Life Press. I have the wonderful privilege of bringing to you God's Word today. Uh, we're in the middle of our new sermon series titled, in the book of Nehemiah, Rebuild and Restore. And, you know, we saw two weeks ago that we're finally at the story of the book of Nehemiah, where the people of God are rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem. So if you have your Bibles, please open up to the book of Nehemiah chapter 4. Now, if I could ask kindly to stand as an act of worship as we read God's perfect word. And as a reminder, my sermon is going to be imperfect because I'm a sinner in need of grace. But this is the most perfect word that I have for all of us here this morning. So Nehemiah chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Now when Sembalat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged. And he jeered at the Jews, and he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, Yes, what they're building, if a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight. For they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. So we built the wall. And all the wall was joined together to half its height for the people had a mind to work. But when Sanballat and Tobiah the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry. And they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. And we prayed to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. In Judah, it was said, the strength of those who bear their burdens is failing. There's too much rubble by ourselves. We will not be able to rebuild the wall. And our enemies said, they will not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. At that time, the Jews who lived near then came from all directions and said to us, Ten times you must return to us. So in the lowest parts of the space, behind the wall, in open places, I stationed the people by their clans, with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. In verse 19, and I said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, the work is great and widely spread, and we are separated on the wall far from one another. In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet rally to us there, our God will fight for us. Please be seated as this is the reading of God's word. Friends, there's a show on Netflix called Squid Game. Don't worry, I won't spoil it for us here. It's been going viral everywhere. Uh, It's successful. Uh, It's gotten one of the highest ratings on Netflix so far. It's definitely put Korean shows on the map for the rest of the world to see. But you know, I read about the backstory of this show where the script of Squid Game was actually written all the way back in 2009. But it was met with such strong opposition and rejected by so many studios for about 10 years straight because it was either too gory or unrealistic, and the opposition was enough to the point where the creator had to stop writing the scripts altogether, sell his laptop for $600 because of his financial need. But after 10 years of persevering, it's the number one show on Netflix in 90 different countries, and it's set to become the most watched show in Netflix history. You know, we all love these stories of perseverance in the midst of opposition and then at least a success. And church, as we return now back to some sort of normalcy after a long year and a half, all of us have dreams, goals, aspirations that we hope to achieve and build. Maybe you want to finish your school and graduate in person and have a successful career after. Or you want to continue to raise our children well. You want to build a happy, God-loving family and marriage. We want to restore some of the relationship that's had a falling out and be surrounded by many friends and peers to be well-respected and loved. And we want to be a church here that is reformed in theology, counseling in community, disciples making disciples, 
and a sent and sending church for the glory of God. But even as we transition to more now in-person gatherings and worship and face-to-face interactions, there are still oppositions, roadblocks, and hindrances that we face that hinder us from getting to where we want to be and rebuild and restore our lives back to where it was. Maybe the opposition is the deep political division that we're facing that's caused a big rift and division amongst your friends and family. Maybe it's the continuing fear of getting sick that prevents you from freely seeing people. Maybe it's the heightened state of loneliness and depression that keeps you from doing even the mundane, ordinary things. Or maybe it's the laziness and complacency that you just can't seem to shake off and be productive at home, at church, at work, or at school. You know, whatever the case, if you look around, we are surrounded by opposition, roadblocks, hindrances, and brokenness all around us, and we wonder if really God can really restore, redeem, rebuild all the hurts, all the setbacks, all the loneliness and pain that we've faced so far. And you know, as we dive deeper into our passage today in Nehemiah 4, we see Nehemiah and the people of Israel also faced with opposition from accomplishing their God-given vision, God-given goal to rebuild the city and the wall. And so three simple points as we look at our passage today. First, let's look at the opposition from without and how Nehemiah dealt with them. Second, we'll take a look at the opposition from within and how Nehemiah responded. And last but not least, we'll take a look at Nehemiah's confidence in whom or what he found confidence to deal with and respond to the oppositions that he faced. So first, opposition from without. Second, opposition from within. And then Nehemiah's confidence. First point, opposition from without. We saw two weeks ago in Nehemiah chapter 3 that Nehemiah rallied up the people, united them to work side by side, finally next to one another from one gate to another, and then finally start to rebuild the wall. And it's a glorious picture of God's people coming together to restore and rebuild what is supposed to be not only their physical protection against the enemies, but also a spiritual sign that God resides with them and that they're brought inside the wall into the presence of God. But we see in our passage that we just read from verses 1 to 3, the opposition that comes from outside the city. Where Sanballat, who we saw back in chapter 2, and Tobiah the Ammonite begin to show their opposition to Nehemiah and the people rebuilding this wall of Jerusalem. And Nehemiah describes Sanballat as angry, greatly enraged, and in front of his army, he begins to taunt and verbally assault the Jewish people from building the wall. Look at me in verse 2. Sanballat says, what are these feeble Jews doing? He's making fun of how weak and powerless they look. Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? He's mocking their intention and ambition, saying, do they really think they'll finish and give a thanksgiving sacrifice after? Will they finish in a day? He's undermining their confidence. Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? He's exaggerating the damage of the wall and reminding them how hopeless they are. And then Tobiah the Ammonite, the leader of the enemy nation of Israel, joins alongside him and says, even a fox could jump on that wall, and it will come crumbling down, showing how useless that chapter 3 work has been for the Israelites. And friends, maybe you know what it was like for Nehemiah and for the people of Israel, your coach, your teacher telling you that you have no chance. Maybe a jealous coworker or a friend trying to discourage you and put you down, especially when things finally started to look good and seemed like the light at the end of the tunnel was getting closer and bigger for the Israelites I'm sure the people of Israel, as tired as they must already have been, were even more discouraged and more defeated as they looked out at these two armies taunting and verbally assaulting them. And in this situation, church, how do you respond? Do you respond with anger and fight back? Do you just fold and give up? Or do you just get more motivated and work even harder at the danger of being a workaholic, making your dream, your goal, your vision, the ultimate idol of your life. Well, let's look at verse 4, how Nehemiah responded to this opposition. He says, Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Nehemiah, as we've seen in chapter 1, is not only a savvy, courageous leader, but he's also a man of prayer, a man who exhales prayer in any and every given circumstance. 
And even through these verbal taunts and mental warfare with the enemies, Nehemiah's first response is prayer. Hear, O our God, for we are despised. And it's not our typical kneeling down, closing our eyes, putting our hands together kind of prayer, but if you could just imagine for a moment here, imagine Nehemiah standing in front of the defeated, discouraged people, looking out at his army. He's standing up tall for everyone to see and is stretching out his arm and loudly crying out, God, listen, because we're going to pray and we need you to hear us. And you could hear the emotions in the prayer when Nehemiah prays with anger and vengeance. Verse 4, turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. Church, this is what we call in the Old Testament an imprecatory prayer or vengeance prayer. And if we had more time, we could dive deeper into this difficult topic. But J.I. Packer summarizes and puts it simply this way. The key principle here is stated in Psalm 139, verses 21 and 22. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? I have nothing but hatred for them. I'll count them my enemies. The nearer we come to the state of mind, which is a spinoff from the desire that God's will be done, his kingdom come, and his name be hallowed and glorified, the less problem shall we have with vengeance prayers. And notice here in our passage, Nehemiah is not asking God to punish them because they've hurt his pride, because they've opposed his personal plan to rebuild a wall, to make a name for himself. No, but ultimately, because they've insulted and opposed God in his redemptive plan to rebuild his city for his people. You see, essentially, imprecatory or vengeance prayer is God's people coming together, crying out against injustice, oppression, especially those who persecute God's people for being God's people. And so are we ought to pray against any injustice we see, any oppression. We ought to ask God to be the judge, not asking him to be our personal vengeance, but asking God to do something, especially against those who laugh at God's work, thinking it's foolish. You know, we see this in 1 Corinthians when Apostle Paul writes, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Church, to the world, God's plan, God's vision, God's dream, God's people are foolish and weak. And the Bible is very clear. If you follow Christ, you will be despised. Jesus says in Matthew 10, you will be hated, not just disliked, you'll be hated by all for my name's sake. John chapter, 1 John chapter 3 says, do not be surprised that the world hates you for following Christ. To the world, the fact that we're gathered here on a Sunday morning instead of watching Sunday morning football, the fact that we live by such strict and countercultural rules and values, the fact that as Christians we should even expect to be despised and hated for following Christ is just foolish and nonsense. Maybe, friends, your dream is to build a Christ-centered marriage, and yet there are people around you who scoff and laugh at the idea of self-sacrifice and unconditional love. Maybe you're going through physical illness and you're witnessing how fragile your body can be. And there may be those in your life who just can't understand why you won't curse your God who let this happen to you and give up on him already. Maybe to the students here, your friends keep making fun of you for not doing what they do, for not watching what they watch, for not listening to what they listen to because you know it's not glorifying and pleasing to your God. And maybe you wish to build your reputation at work as a Christian, but they scoff at your honesty, your integrity, and tell you you won't get very far with those values. And the application here, friends, is not that when you face these opposition and persecution and people despise you for following Christ, for you to pray, turn back their taunt on them and give them up to be plundered in the land. Do not cover their guilt. That's not the application here, but it's to look to the one who was taunted and spat on. It's to look to the one who was truly despised and rejected even by his own heavenly father, to the one who had no sin but took upon your sins and my sins so that our sins may be blotted out so that we would not be despised for very much longer. 
Friends, what Nehemiah shows us in his first reaction to the set of opposition here is that he didn't talk back to Sanballat or Tobiah. He remained silent, but cried loudly to his God in prayer. And as Raymond Brown, a commentator, describes, Nehemiah prayed urgently into the audience chamber of God, trusting that God is not only the one who hears, but also the one who can give help. Or Nehemiah prayed honestly in his righteous anger because it's better to pray honestly and express our pain to God than hold a grudge and build resentment and not pray. And as a side comment, church, it's okay to be angry. Jesus was angry. Or not all anger is sinful, and maybe you have reasons to be angry because someone sinned against you, someone wronged you. But as Dane Orland writes in his book, be comforted by this. Jesus is angry alongside you. He joins you in your anger. Indeed, he's angrier than you could ever be about the wrong done to you. Your just anger is a shadow of his. And his anger, unlike yours, has zero taint of sin in it. As you consider those who have wronged you, let Jesus be angry on your behalf. His anger can be trusted. For it is an anger that springs from his compassion for you. In that knowledge, release your debtor and breathe again. And sisters and brothers, in the midst of your opposition, whenever you're being shamed, embarrassed, ridiculed for following Jesus, the application is that you and I ought to pray and look to the one again who was truly despised and crucified so that you can know that your reputation, your identity, your name, your value will not be despised and made fun of forever. Because your name is written in the book of life with the blood of the one who was given up to be plundered for your sins and mine. Because your heavenly father has blotted out your sins completely through this rebuilding, restoring, redemptive work of Jesus, you and I can take a hit to our small reputation, to our influence, to our name. We can be persecuted and we can still go on to our heavenly father in confidence asking him for strength for guidance, for wisdom, and comfort. And plus, in this gospel truth, you can do what Nehemiah didn't do in our passage, which is to even ask God to forgive our enemies as we have been truly forgiven. And in verse 6, Nehemiah so succinctly writes, so we built the wall. He just moves on. He works And he ignores the jeers and overcomes this mental war and is able to galvanize his people once again through prayer and confidence in their God. And they end up building the entire wall to half its height. It brings us to our second point, the opposition from within. You know, having failed with their first attempt, we see Senballat and Tobiah even more angry and they join with the rest of the enemies surrounding the entire wall in the city. If you look at it geographically speaking, Sanballat and Samaria are from the north. Tobiah, the Ammonites, were from the east. The Arabs were from the south. And the Ashdodites from the west. They were completely surrounded now on all four sides. And they were, in verse 7, very angry because Nehemiah simply ignored them, prayed, trusted in God, and carried on building the entire wall to half its height. And in verse 11, we see that they're even planning surprise guerrilla attacks on the workers, that they won't even know they're coming, and they'll kill them now to stop this work. And that's when we see the opposition from within beginning to happen. You see, all the verbal taunts, and now even the news of physical threat that they might be getting killed, must have gotten under the skins of the Israelites, both inside the wall and outside the city. First, we see the fear And the exhaustion in the workers themselves in verse 10, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There is too much rubble. By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. Building the wall itself was already hard. But trying to do it while getting no sleep because you have no idea when the enemies are going to come and kill you, that's impossible. So the builders and the workers' morale and their power and strength are now at rock bottom. Not only that, second, we see the fear of the Israelites living outside the city. Right? He writes in verse 12, They came from all directions and said to us ten times, You must return to us. And in Hebrew, basically that phrase ten times means over and over and over and over again. 
or even their own people who live just outside the wall gave up on them to just, and told them to give up, stop making the enemies angry. Because if you think about it, these Israelites who were living just outside the wall would be the first ones to be killed and plundered and attacked if they didn't stop rebuilding the wall. So there was panic, there was fear, there was hopelessness, and even their own people, God's people, were discouraged and defeated and giving up on this plan to rebuild the entire wall. And church, maybe you felt both the fear and the hopelessness of the Israelites, but also the discouragement of Nehemiah in your life. You see, you try over and over again to be patient with your children, try to teach them God-glorifying way to raise them, and yet they keep running farther away. They reject your parenting. They reject your love, and you wonder to yourself if you failed as a parent. You try over and over again to be a better husband, a better wife, but conflicts keep rising. Tensions are higher, and you wonder if there's anything else that I can do or if you failed as a spouse. You try over and over again to be a better son, a better daughter, to be a better friend, a better worker, a better student, but plans keep getting frustrated, and you doubt your own abilities and skills, and then you doubt your own worth and identity, and you go down this rabbit hole of despair, depression, discouragement, and hopelessness. And maybe you've been witnessing your body and your mind just breaking down, failing, Doctor's appointments after appointments, procedures after procedures, therapy sessions after sessions, medications after medications. And maybe if you're like me, you've been trying to be a better Christian, a better follower, a better disciple of Jesus, but you keep messing up. You keep running to the same habitual sins of your life over and over again. You begin to doubt to yourself whether God really sees you as lovable, as redeemable, as salvageable. And friends, in these moments of hopelessness and discouragement that comes not only from outside circumstances, but from within, where or what do we do? What can we do? Well, let's look at Nehemiah's response once more in verse 9. Spoiler alert, he prays again. He says, we prayed to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. But this time, he's not only praying by himself, but he's praying with the people. He says, we prayed together, and not just to his God, who gave him this grand vision to rebuild the wall, but he says, we prayed to our God, the God of the people, who cares and calls and loves not just the significant, not just the important, not just the leader, but also who calls and loves and cares the lowest, the the marginalized, the weak, the non-important, both the priests and the goldsmiths that we saw two weeks ago, both Nehemiah, the leader, and people who are building and working. But not only does he pray for God's protection, stirring others up to join with him in prayer, but he turns the gaze, the attention of the people to the person and work of their personal God. As verse 14 says, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. In other words, do not fear. Do not be hopeless. Do not be discouraged. Remember who our God is. You see, church, Nehemiah and Israelites, for them, the Lord they ought to remember, the Lord they can gain strength from, was the same Lord who defeated the Egyptians when they were enslaved to Egypt. It was the same Lord who split the Red Sea. It was the same Lord who defeated Goliath. It was the same Lord who, through King David, built a majestic kingdom, and it was the same Lord who built a temple through King Solomon, and it was the same Lord who told them, you will go into exile, but you will come back and rebuild the wall. It's the same Lord who who they're living out this promise they have as they rebuild this wall. You see, Nehemiah, strategic and savvy and genius in leadership as he was, he led the people through his personal trust, his personal confidence in the Lord who is great and awesome, who is steadfast when everything around you and me is so uncertain, ever-changing, who is gracious and merciful when in your panic, my panic, we continue to fail to trust in our Lord. The Lord, your Lord, my Lord, who is great and awesome in wisdom and grace and faithfulness, 
who is able to save us not only from physical danger, not only from mental pressure, not only from financial anxiety, but also from our utter spiritual immorality and destitution. Friends, in the midst of your panic, your threats, your exhaustion, your fear, your discouragement, and your hopelessness. The application is the same as Nehemiah's words. Remember the Lord. Remember your Lord, my Lord, Jesus Christ, who Nehemiah could only see a glimpse and a shadow of, but you and I have in the fullest sense today. In your hopelessness, remember Jesus, your Lord, who gives you hope not only in this life, but the life to come, that no matter your state, your situation, no matter the tribulation that he says, take heart, for I have overcome the world. In your defeat and discouragement that comes from within, remember Jesus who knows discouragement, who knows defeat and disappointment firsthand from even his closest friends, rejecting him and betraying him. Remember Jesus who knows utter defeat as he hung upon the cross and bore the wrath of his heavenly Father for your sins and mine. Remember Jesus, your Lord, who has been faithful from beginning to the end. Remember your Lord Jesus who so graciously called you when you wanted nothing to do with him, when you were kicking and screaming, wanting nothing to do with him, who loved you when you were unlovable, who carried you when you couldn't go any further. Remember how far he has carried you until this very moment. But there wasn't a single day when he let you fall. There wasn't a single day that he left you all alone. And friends, your life and my life may not be perfect right now. But you have a perfect Savior, a perfect friend, a perfect Lord who will be faithful to the very end when he brings you into glory and perfection. And you know, this act of remembering your Lord is not just a Harry Potter magic spell you can just do and make all of your things and brokenness disappear. No, it's what will help you now, as the rest of the passage tells us today, to resume back to work, to resume the work and the calling that you and I are called to, each and every one of us as God's people. This is our last and final point, Nehemiah's confidence. And we see in verse 15, after spurring on his people to remember their God, after praying with and for the people, after a careful direction and genius strategy to have the builders of the wall also be soldiers carrying a hammer and a sword by taking night shift and day shift to get enough rest, the enemies couldn't do anything. And then Nehemiah says, God had frustrated their plan. He doesn't say, I frustrated their plan with my strategic planning, with my prayer and speech, but he says God had frustrated their plan, and so we returned and built the wall. And when you read the rest of the passage, despite all these oppositions and setbacks to rebuilding the wall, one thing Nehemiah doesn't do that many leaders through history have done already is to run away. You see, Nehemiah doesn't put himself first. He doesn't hide away in a bunker. He doesn't run away to the enemies and make deals to keep his wealth, to keep his power, he doesn't fold in utter defeat, giving up on his people, who didn't even trust him at his work. But instead, Nehemiah stays with the people. He has so much confidence that the same God who called him to this almost impossible task of rebuilding the glorious city of Jerusalem will once again protect him and the people and will complete it even by frustrating the plans of the enemies. You see, running away, hiding away is not even an option for Nehemiah because he has so much confidence. As verse 20 tells us, he says, Our God, not might, but our God will fight for us. Sisters and brothers, on this side of the cross, where you and I are right now in this redemptive history, you can have bigger, stronger, better confidence than Nehemiah did. Not only when things are going well in your life, but especially when life seems to fall apart, you have opposition all around you, you feel all the doubts and anxiety and discouragement coming from within you because you and I have a better and greater Nehemiah who left his heavenly throne to be born in a manger, to walk the dirt of this world, to eat with sinners, to cry with the broken, to save the unwanted and unloved. You and I have a better and greater Nehemiah in Jesus who not only stays with us in the good times, but stays with us when our relationships go sour, 
who stays with us, with us when feelings of hopelessness flood your mind, who stays with us when it feels like you missed that one opportunity to be significant and important, when friends let you down, when you've been wronged or misunderstood, or when you're just helplessly watching the brokenness of your world close in on you and make you want to just give up. You have a better and greater Nehemiah in Jesus Christ who knows exactly what that feels like. He doesn't scoff at how weak you are. He doesn't run away holding his nose thinking your mess smells so much. Instead, he sits with you. He embraces you. He stays with you and reminds you that you are never alone. In other words, friends, if you are in Christ today, as Dane Orland writes once again, you have a friend who in your sorrow will never lob down a pep talk from heaven. He cannot bear to hold himself at a distance. Nothing can hold him back. His heart is too bound up with yours. That's your confidence. He is your confidence. He's the one who Nehemiah placed his confidence in by saying he will fight for us, and he's the one, friends, that has already fought for us on this side of the cross. Nehemiah knew that his God that will fight for him was the same God of David who wrote in Psalm 27, the Lord is my light, whom shall I fear? And friends, if you're here today and you're wondering, where's my confidence? How can I muster up to face tomorrow's challenges and opposition? Look with me in Romans 8.31, as Pastor Min has took us through the Declaration of Pardon, this is the fulfillment of Nehemiah's cry when he says, Our God will fight for us. This tells us that he has fought for us. Romans 8.31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution or famine, or nakedness or danger or sword? Verse 37, no. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, your Lord and my Lord. As we come to a close, dear brothers and sisters of New Life Press, dear fellow sinners and sufferers who are faced with opposition, rejection, and discouragement daily, if you are in Christ, if you have put your faith not in yourself, not in your own abilities, but if you've put your faith in the greater and better Nehemiah who has already fought for you in the battle, who leads you and stays with you in your pain, who has overcome the world so that you can take heart. There is no opposition. There is no shame. There is no rejection. There is no sin, no guilt that is too great that will stop God's redemptive work of not just rebuilding a physical wall, but his work of rebuilding God's people, the temple of God, his precious church right here where you and I are the living precious stones because he is faithful to the very end. So church, when you walk out these doors today, know that you have a savior who prays for you right now and every day, whether you've been crying out to him like Nehemiah did or you've been having your back turned on him for quite some time. When you go to sleep tonight, know that you have a savior who protects you day and night from physical and spiritual threats. You have a savior who gives you the armor of God in Ephesians 6. You have a savior when you wake up tomorrow morning because you have a perfect leader in Christ who can unite a people for himself from all sorts of backgrounds and pain and culture, who can bring together even the doubtful, the jeering, the fearful, and the faithful by his grace and love in the gospel. And that redemptive work of rebuilding God's people is happening right here in the seat next to you in the seat in front of you and behind you as we look all around how God's grace is working in everyone's lives. But until then, the work resumes and continue to trust in the better Nehemiah and draw your confidence from the greater and true Nehemiah, Jesus Christ, who loves even sinners like you and me to the uttermost. Let's pray.
Our Father in heaven, we come before you now to thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, so often when we face opposition, rejection, discouragements from outside and within, Lord, we cling on to whatever we have as the confidence, our abilities, our financial security, our charisma, our gifts, and your son is the last thing that we turn to for our confidence. So, Father, we pray by your spirit you would remind us of how utterly defeated and hopeless we are apart from you. But when we place our faith in the better and true Nehemiah, help us to know how strong, how courageous, how confident we can be to persevere through the persecution and the rejection we face here and one day be close and near to the one who came down to save us. So be with our church, Lord, transform us to be a church that is confident in our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray.